All right, it seems to work. Well then, let's get started. First of all, my name's Watcher. My self-imposed mission was to watch over the wasteland, looking for lost ponies and groups of adventurers, hoping to eventually find those that carried the Elms of Harmony. Now things are changing, and I have friends that'll help me with my task. I'm not alone anymore, and I finally have some time for doing things I feel need to be done. And that's the reason why now I'm recording this tape, and just for this tale, I'm asking you to call me Mr. Questioner. This is a story that could seem unimportant, or even silly, but it's about dreams, and about memories. It's a story about two large, innocent pink eyes that couldn't see the horrors of our times, and kept believing that somewhere beyond those ruined walls, inside the slave pens, or even in the raiders' camps, every pony was still a pretty pony. And at the end of her journey, where the road met the ocean, the ghost foal that her lost mom finally found a place to rest. Sure. She was a little late, but I was told that when she finally accepted her fate, Puppy left with a smile. Like she were following an old postcard, the filly went down the Big 52, showing everyone she met what ponies had been in the past and what they could still be. Somehow, changing the way they saw themselves, making them see a better past and making them wish for a better tomorrow. She wasn't actually trying to change the world or even to save lives, but that might have been why so many ponies took notice. Since she was no longer preacher, but simply herself, it was easy to see that there was no fanaticism or weird ideals in her. Just a little pony with big pink eyes that knew, for a fact, that no one could really be that evil. And this, this is what happened in the few months between Puppy's arrival at Emerald Shores, and today. The ponies of Emerald Shores came back to the town shortly after the Wild Herd's defeat. When they arrived from the NCA, they brought, I found the graves on the hill and the remains of the crushed Ferris wheel. Alas, what really startled them was that some pony had changed the name of the town on all the signs. Now the town was called Nightmare's Fall. The survivors of Ironwork started to rebuild the town helped by their neighbors. Since the battle, the settlement had a shortage of adult ponies, so the rangers decided to settle in the town, making it their new headquarters. Not every pony was happy with this new situation, but the rangers proved themselves vital during the liberation of the town, and eventually even the most stubborn of them came to accept them. With ivory tower destroyed and ironworks reduced to a shadow of its former self, Broccoli gathered all the ponies that it could, I didn't want to live in a ghost town or hadn't had a home to live in at all. The work in the fields improved greatly, and the farmers diversified their crops, for the joy of the foals. Now the, they grow broccoli and cabbage. The crater at Ivory Tower was filled by the seasonal rains, and a small trading outpost had been built along the route between broccoli and rust manor. The town is very small and lightly fortified but it's growing fast, and some pony is starting to build farms around the lake. The town still doesn't have a name, but the traders call it the Hole. Rust Manor was attacked during the Enclave conflict. The town wasn't able to repel the attackers, and the control tower was completely destroyed. Numerous ponies were killed, but the survivors are already beginning to rebuild their home. It won't be easy, but nothing is easy in the Wasteland. Sun City is still a war zone. The Sand Sweepers and a number of small bands are currently fighting each other to gain control of the Desert's Gem. Since the Hired Hooves retreated from Sun City during the Enclave conflict and never came back, the settlement's still a dangerous place, avoided by almost every caravan. For those that do dare to risk their lives, though, the inner town is full of old war tech that could make you rich for the rest of your life. Tunnel Town expanded on both sides of Sugar Top Mountain, and now is the third largest town along the Big 52. The prices for using the tunnel have been cut considerably, and the city began to a service of long-range patrols to keep at bay the groups of raiders and slavers along the route in the town's territory. 
Salt Cube City is still the biggest, along the Big 52, and it has grown ever more since the ghouls left the dome. The hired hooves are expanding their influence even outside the route, and have opened offices in the nearby towns. The Talons don't seem very happy with this policy, and tension between the two mercenary groups is growing rapidly. The Red Trotters didn't charge very much. They stayed faithful to their tribal customs and are still changing and charging caravans <coughs> to travel along their territory. But now fools don't have to pay the fee. It's not a big improvement, but the tribe has opened relations with other settlements, and they're actually trying to improve the safety of that part of the route. The Applejack's rangers helped in reconstructing ironworks, establishing their new base in the town stable. During the last battle at the cave, all four of Ironworks surviving paladins were dispatched to help with defending the place, and I had the opportunity to meet both Cold Shower and Scold. The battle was hard, and Shower didn't survive it. She is now sleeping besides Goss and Emerald Shores. Cold has grown distant after losing her. It seems the old scribe is doomed to survive all his friends, a fate that I can easily understand. Jammy and Happy married and I was told she's expecting. Since the marriage is quite a recent news, I think that they hadn't expected to be celebrating again so soon. When asked what name they were planning to give the foal, Happy stated that she's still a bit uncertain, but it won't be Puppy Smiles. Molten Gold didn't stop his grave robbing career for a long after the battle of the Nightmare. The ghoul left as soon as he recovered and sailed south on a steamboat along with a group of adventurers. I haven't heard anything from him since. Solus and Pinky Seven are actually able to become friends in the end. I was contacted by P7 a little after the first Enclave attacks. She was curious what this questioner puppy was always talking about, so we had a chat, and even if I don't think I'm going to trust her or Solus anytime soon, I think they aren't going to make any trouble for us for a while. She actually scared me a bit when she told me about her and Solus' idea of programming a new AI and calling it Puppy, I hope that was just a joke. <clears throat> Lonesome Pony recovered from his wounds and went back to Radio 52, keeping the Big 52 together with his encouraging speeches and all of his music. DJ Goodstuff is still working with him, but when I tried asking when they were going to marry, both of them laughed at me. During the Enclave conflict, Radio 52 kept broadcasting. It was small enough that the Pegasi didn't bother to shut it down. The radio helped with organization of defenses and boosted morale for the defenders. It wasn't much, but it was enough for those that fought during the conflict. Mr. White trotted back to Salt Cube City. The loss of Sagebrush changed him deep inside, even if his sister neighbor blamed him for it. After resigning his place of leadership, he became a traveling merchant, and as far as I know, he's still running along the route, bartering for every sort of merchandise. This is just a rumor, but it seems that one of his guards is a unicorn mare, with a tower as a cutie mark. Maybe he didn't want to lose the opportunity to hire some pony, and had the guts to spank a nightmare. Or he simply wanted to give a raider a second chance. After all, you gotta care, right? After Long Ear's demise, a new filly in her tribe got the farseer cutie mark, becoming the next shaman. I have no idea how their powers work, but it seems some sort of mix of powerful drugs and innate precognition. I just know that it's very tolling and quickly consumes the mare's body, so that a single pony sacrifices her life to keep the tribe. A boon that brings a curse. There's still a pony I've never met in person, and I'm starting to doubt his actual existence. Puppy described him to me as the baddest evil villain ever. Count Horsetile. I asked several travelers and caravan guards, but no one has been able to give me a single clue as to this cruel noble pony. I guess his mystery will remain unsolved. Henrietta is still running from the Talons. It seems there has never been good blood between them and the Firebrights. The young Griffin is keeping up the family tradition. I tried to talk to Gwendyon to see if some sort of truce could be arranged. I do hope that Henry can accept the parlay. After all, she was Puppy's best friend, and seeing a girl die because of a feud she didn't even start is something I don't really want to see. 
The wild herd is dispersing and fled from their outpost on the coast again. This time they suffered heavy losses, both in number and in pride. But every pony knows that they'll come back one day. Hopefully, even if they once more strike the Big 52, it'll be without the help of an army of robots. And that could be enough to let the good pony sleep quietly for the moment. The lost herd seems to be gone. With Sidekick's death, the last of those damned souls found peace at last. And finally, Equestria will be able to forget one of the many horrors of the war. May those poor foals find a deserved rest in whatever awaits them past this life. So, this is the end of Puppy's story. Did she really change something along her path? Will her action no matter in the long run? I have... Sorry. I has no idea. But I think I'll miss the way she talked. And the way she took everything so lightly. Another shard of the Equestria I loved forever gone. But I still hope that I'll live long enough to be able to see a filly like her again. But this time it won't be a ghost from the past. But a daughter of the present. Speaking of ghosts... The legend of the Ghost of the Big 52 is still alive, even if it seems more like a nightmare night tale than a real story. It's said that when the sun goes down and the moon is waning, a ghostly figure rides along the route, silent like a shadow and swift like the wind. It looks for the souls of the wicked, slavers, raiders, and the evildoers to look in the darkness, waiting for easy prey. At least two groups of raiders were actually found dead along the route, they didn't show a single wound. Their weapons were still fully loaded, and they were clearly ready to strike. But they died on the spot. No explanation. Killed by a presence that didn't leave a single clue. So now I have to ask you one thing. Do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> Day 4. Time approximately 7.30 p.m. Location, downtown Salt Cube City. Sandbox turned the wheel left trying to make the airship fly against the wind, but it was an impossible task. Friend Force One was losing pieces along the way since takeoff, and two engines had already failed. The ghoul slammed his hoof down on the intercom and yelled, Soft air! We need more power! We're getting pushed back by the damned nightly breeze! I don't know how, but give me more knots. The reply from the communication device had more in common with an electrician than an actual conversation. But it was about the balloon losing gas and the engines catching fire. Sandbox cursed, before talking again in the instrument. Okay, don't worry. I've got a backup plan. We'll crash the airship here, so the wind won't send us back to Salt Cube City. If the reply from the other side of the line was a complaint, it never reached Sandbox. At the very same moment, the whole world decided to become pure light. Just an endless, blinding, perfectly silent light that enveloped everything. There was no pain and there was no fear. Just light. Day Unknown. Time Unknown. Location Unknown. When Sandbox opened his eyes again, he had the unsettling feeling that there was absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing at all. He took his time to look for a moment around the flying deck, trying to understand what had happened. Well, the wheel was still there, the sky was all starry, and commands were working. The lights were all lit. Wait a moment. The lights are all lit? There are stars outside? What the? Yes. The airship was working perfectly, and by perfectly it meant that the whole damned room seemed as new as the day it went out from the docks. The floor was shining, the commands were clean, the wheel was even waxed, and the windows, they were so clear that you could even see yourself in the... And Sandbox saw Sandbox. Surprise on his muzzle was giving way to realization. Slowly, he touched his face with a hoof. It was his real face. The one he had before becoming a ghoul. He was a pony again. He was... dead. He was dead. This was the only possible reaction for all of this. 
But if he was dead, then why was he still on the ship? Was this some sort of afterlife punishment where he had to fly a ship forever, like the flying Dutch mare? Where were the others trapped forever on the thing with him? And why? He didn't want to fly forever. He had to see Agatha. She... she was waiting for him somewhere. He couldn't just fly a stupid ship for all eternity. A loud whistle interrupted Sandbox's shipwreck of desperation, making him turn towards the deck's entrance. A feminine voice announced her arrival while the door slammed open. Captain on the bridge! A pink mare with a pink mane and bright blue eyes appeared in front of the former ghoul. She was wearing a navy officer uniform and sported the largest smile box tape had ever seen on a pony. Miss... M Minister Pie? Pinky dismissed Sandbox with a wave of a hoof. Ah, call me Captain Pie. I don't like that ministry thing. It wasn't happy at all anyway. The young mare started jumping in every corner of the bridge, giggling and yelling enthusiastically. Yay, I knew this little filly was going to fly sooner or later. Oh, look, look at this. All the arrows on the panels are pink, exactly like I asked. It's, it's fantastic. The chief technician still stood with a confused expression on his muzzle, looking at the hyperactive pony touching everything while moving around at a speed that wasn't physically possible. I... can I help you somehow? Before Sand had the time to finish the question, he found himself staring into Pinky's enormous blue eyes, nose to nose with her. Sure you can. They're all waiting for you in the lounge. Move that slow rump of yours and join the party. I'll get there as soon as I'm done having fun here. The stallion nodded, slowly stepping back towards the door and never losing eye contact with Pinkie Pie. She was a little bit scary, especially from the point of view of a pony that had been dead for less than ten minutes. Once on the stairs, he turned on his tail and rushed to the airship's recreational bridge. The saloon wasn't crowded. Still, it was quite populated especially since Sandbox clearly recalled that aboard the Friend Force One there were just four ponies when it took off. Now, instead he counted eight guests. It was easy to recognize Soft Air from his tactical military technician jumpsuit and Peach Blossom with her blooming peach flower cutie mark. The middle-aged mare with the stethoscope had to be Dr. Gitwell. Wow. She had was quite a sight with all of her skin and muscles in the right place. This left a griffin and four other ponies that Sandbox couldn't recognize. The griffin was sipping tea while reading a newspaper, sitting on a couch. He was wearing combat armor and had several weapons on him. Two of the ponies, a mare and a stallion, had the typical padded suit used under power armor, and they were standing side by side in front of a table with drinks and snacks. They didn't pay attention to the table anyway, being too occupied with nuzzling each other, seemingly at peace. The third pony was sitting alone in front of the window, looking outside the ship. He sighed and shook his head. In his eyes, it was easy to read some sort of regret or resignation. As to his left, too many things undone behind and wanted to go back. The fourth pony was a unicorn mare with a long cape. She had the Sand Sweeper's traditional jewelry on her. Maybe she was a dead farseer. The mare seemed different from the others. More a shadow than a real presence. She was also the one that trotted towards Sandbox when he stepped inside the room. Greetings. I see that Pinky let you come down at last. I guess this means that we are ready to proceed. She should be here soon, unless she got lost again. Sandbox frowned. What's going on? Who is she? Who are you? Listen, I'm not a troublemaker, but I'd... He stopped talking when the mare approached the door and pulled it open. A pink fool with a blonde mane and two big eyes trotted inside the room. Puppy still had her pretty pink ticket in her teeth. She didn't understand how exactly she arrived in the place, but it didn't matter. There were games and treats, and it totally seemed like a super fancy party. It was everything she'd ever dreamed of. And it was full of ponies to boot. And a chicken. Sandbox felt his heart sink in an icy grasp. 
Of all the ponies he was expecting to see, Puppy Smiles was the last one. Oh, little one. I'm... I'm so sorry. How could this fool smile even a moment like this? What happened? Who... How did you arrive here? Puppy tilted her head, unable to recognize the pony in front of her, but he seemed very nice, so it was all right. Hi, Mr. Pretty Pony. I'm Puppy Smiles, and I'm going to find my mom. A super nice skelly pony gave me this super fancy ticket and sent me here. And I was told that mom was just over there, after the ride. The little filly paused for a moment, checking the place. Ah, are we there yet? Sandbox blinked his eyes, trying to understand what the foal meant, but Long Ears came to his help, whispering in her ear. Her mother is dead. This only succeeded in making Sand's perplexity glow. You... You are happy to be dead? Puppy giggled. The nice skelly pony told me so, Mr. Pretty Pony. But I feel fine and I'm gonna find Mom. This is like, the best thing ever. But... She was so... Happy. And even if she was explained what was going on, what would have been the point of it? Boxtape smiled and nodded. Yes. Yes, it is. So, do you want to play something with the others until we arrive? In the meantime, the various ponies in the room had slowly gathered around Puppy. They're all looking at her with various degrees of perplexity or sadness. Cold shower and goss approached the filly. The mare was the first to talk. I'm sorry we had to fight you. I wish there was a better way. Goss nodded for a moment, sighing deeply. Ah, why is everyone sad? Where are the pony games? I want to play hide and seek. Or pin the tail on the pony. And then I want to dance and... Oh, I hope the ponytail is pink. Pink is my super favorite color. I'm the best tail pinner ever. Puppy was already jumping on her hooves, trying to look beyond the small group of ponies. Pinky, now wearing a flight attendant uniform, followed Puppy through the door, and patted the foal on the head. I'm sorry, Puppy, but there's no time for that. We've sailed through Star Ocean. Now we have arrived. The ride ends here, fillies and gentle colts. Thank you all for choosing the Afterlight Airlines, and have a pleasant stay. The pink mare moved rapidly towards the door, opening it and revealing to all the other ponies a wonderful landscape made of green hills and small ponds. Small herds of ponies dotted the meadows, while Pegasi sat on clouds populating a wonderful blue sky. The passengers trot outside the ship, staring in amazement at the place. It seemed like a dream come true. Here and there was possible to see some roofs of some houses, and on the distant hills there was a large apple orchard. Even Puppy was left speechless by the beauty of the place. Everything was perfect. The trees, the meadows, all the pretty ponies, and the sunny sky. It... It was even better than Ponyville. It was so beautiful. The only thing that was missing was... Puppy Smiles froze for a second, her eyes staring at the small herd of ponies grazing on the boundaries of a daisy field. The smile on her face grew bigger and bigger as she galloped towards the ponies of the grass. One of the figures looked up and smiled at the oncoming filly, who was now crying with joy, unable to say anything but a single word. Mom!